essentially, we know that, that won't happen, right? That's the first point in our analysis that's kind of being, that, that's being verified. There will not be a good deal in Copenhagen. The UN will not solve the climate crisis. But what have they actually done in the last 14 years, right? Because Kyoto Protocol has been, effect, has been in effect since 2005. The UNFCCC has existed since 1994. So what have they actually done? A, ecologically, since the UNFCCC came into force and since the Kyoto Protocol came into force, emissions have been rising and their rate of increase has been rising. So they've been rising faster than ever, with one small exception, which is the last year. But we'll get to that small exception in a second. Right? Basically, Kyoto, UNFCCC have had zero impact on reducing emissions. In fact, emissions have risen faster since they, as, the, as they did before since they came into force. Some people who defend the Kyoto Protocol will now say, but look, you know, without us, it would have been much worse. But that kind of counterfactual argument of saying, well, you know, it could have been even worse than it is now, but it is already pretty bad, it could have been even worse, just shows the total strategic cluelessness <coughs> of the people who are currently working inside the COP process. Because, I'm sorry, from the perspective of the climate crisis and the people losing their livelihoods, saying it would have been better, it would have been worse without us, is just not good enough. Right? We really can and have to do better than it would have been worse without it. Okay, so no relevant ecological effects. The social effects have been pretty interesting. Like, a lot of people talk about climate justice right now, but the false solutions, the carbon offsets, for example, that are being pushed inside the COP, they in fact exacerbate the injustices that are part and parcel of the whole climate crisis. To take one example, if indigenous people in Mexico are being kicked off their land with force of arms in order to then build a big wind farm there, like, that means that we can continue with our own business as usual and continue screwing the climate by continuing screwing the people who have had the least to to, done the least to cause it in the first place. The same if indigenous people in Brazil are being kicked off their land so we can build eucalypt plant eucalyptus plantations there. Dubious ecological effect, but definitely negative social effect, people losing their livelihoods. So in fact, we're just doing more of the same. We're continuing business as usual, and people in the global south are losing their livelihoods. So the negative effect, the, the social effects of the COPS policies have in fact been negative. Zero ecological, negative social effect. Effect three, political. There's this impression, and this is where we come to the legitimation crisis, right? the COP or the UNFCCC create the absolutely false impression that within the dominant political system something is being done to deal with climate change, which there isn't. Nothing is being done inside the political system to deal with climate change. But the existence of the COP creates the false illusion that there is. Right? So I talk to a lot of people about climate change. Well, there are obviously people who don't care about climate change or who don't believe in climate change. But that's another issue. But those who do know and care about climate change, you sort of say, well, look, you know, this is a really important issue. And they're like, yeah, you're right. But are they, they, they're meeting up there, right? They're, they're setting up all these fancy emissions trading things. And then we'll have this really great, efficient way of, of, of reducing emissions. So the COP works like a political shield that insulates the economic and political system that creates the climate crisis from our critique, from social movement pressure. So, this is my number three, right? No ecological effects, negative social effects, and politically, it legitimizes the system that produces the problem in the first place. And what's the fourth effect? Economic, that's where it gets most interesting. Emissions trading, em markets for emissions rights, the, the Deutsche Bank, which you might know, big German but multinationally operating bank, has put out a report saying, yeah, you know, <coughs> Emissions trading won't do anything to solve the climate crisis. It, in fact, won't have any effect in reducing emissions. So thanks, Deutsche Bank, for telling us what we already knew. Emissions trading doesn't reduce emissions. However, it does produce an amazingly beautiful new market in which financial capitalists can play around like they did before and the way they, then, they brought us the last subprime crisis. In 2008, the market for emissions rights was one of the very few global markets that didn't shrink. It, it, was, it was $100 billion large. Now, $100 billion isn't terribly, it sounds a bit cynical, but $100 billion isn't that much money. From the perspective of global financial markets, it's not. And, you know, we're a bit desensitized what with all the, the recovery packages and $700 billion being chucked this way, $700 billion being chucked that way. But by 2015 to 2020, markets for emissions rights are going to be up to 2 to $3 trillion large. Right? Why does this matter? Well, not just because the Enron and Goldman Sachs people who brought us the last crisis are now working to create the next, the next crisis, the next financial crisis. It basically matters because 
it shows that the stuff that the COP does, namely design emissions trading systems as their main policy mechanism, <coughs> doesn't actually deal with the climate crisis, but uses the climate crisis to deal with the overaccumulation crisis, right? Like, you get the connection. COP's not solving the climate crisis, but they are solving the financial crisis a little bit because they're creating a whole new market for financial capital to play around in. 